Good evening, everyone. I'm going to give us another minute or two um, just to make sure some folks are getting in before we get started. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to Equal, a work in progress, voting rights and realities. This program is brought to you by the Charlita and Robin Winston Family Fund for African American History. My name is Lauren Pichtel, and I serve as one of the managers of engagement at the Indiana Historical Society. My role tonight is to get us introduced to the program and Zoom as well as provide additional information in the chat and monitor the Q&A throughout our time together. I have a few pieces of logistics to review. For this event, Marianne, Raven, Brent, and Dr. Tucker Edmonds will discuss our topic for around 50 minutes. And after that, we will begin opening up for any guest questions. So if you have any questions as we go along, please drop those into the question and answer section. We will keep an eye on them and incorporate them into the last half of our discussion tonight. As our conversation goes on, I may be dropping some links and information into the chat that our speakers mentioned. Don't worry if you miss any of them or aren't able to look them up at this time. We will include them all in your follow-up email after this program. This program is being recorded, so you can catch the replay on our website at indianahistory.org in the upcoming weeks. At the Indiana Historical Society, we are Indiana Storyteller, connecting people to the past. It is our mission to collect and preserve Indiana's unique stories, bring Hoosiers together in remembering and sharing the past, and inspire a future grounded in our state's uniting values and principles. We fulfill this mission by collecting millions of paper-based objects, including books, letters, photographs, and more, as well as other story-based mediums, such as oral histories, videos, and born digital content. The Indiana Historical Society is a Smithsonian affiliate and a member of the International Coalition of Sites of Conscious, the only global network of historic sites, museums, and memory initiatives that connects past struggles to today's movements for human rights, turning memory into action. Equal, a work in progress is a conversation-based program series exploring equality through history. Indiana's constitution declares that all people are created equal. Though this revolutionary idea is a foundational principle of our state, it is marred by a myriad of contradictions. This ongoing series started with the complexities of indigenous citizenship, the contextual history of Title IX, and Indiana's relationships with eugenics, and today continues with the conversation around voting rights. These interdisciplinary conversations examine our collective definition of equality to better understand who is considered a citizen, who gets a seat at the table, and who maintains power in our society. I want to take a moment to remind all of us to be compassionate and understanding, to listen, to understand, and apply what you learn today to how we interact with the world around us. And with that, I would like to introduce tonight's panelists. I'm very excited to have this impressive group of people together. They are all true change makers who continuously make real strides and train and change for equity at the polls and beyond across our city and state. So starting with us tonight, we have Raven Redrell, who was part of our team here at the Indiana Historical Society years ago and has certainly launched since and continues to rise. 
Raven is an experienced policy analyst, experienced campaigner, and has held various leadership positions across the region, including serving as the president of the Marion County Young Democrats, the executive director for the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus, seventh congressional chair and the Black Caucus chair for the Indiana Young Democrats, state director of our Black Party, founder of the Black Agenda Convention, co-founder of the Feed the Streets and Saving Our Sisters Initiative, National Action Chair for Don't Sleep, and board member for the Minority Recovery Collective Incorporate. Recently, uh, Raven launched an independent consulting company called the Dreamers Guild that specializes in equity on political campaigns and in policy. Brent Stinson is the Deputy Director of Elections at the Marion County Election Board and has served in various roles in and around the State House and City County Council building. Brent started as a legislative intern with the Indiana House of Representatives, then administrative assistant with the Marion County City County Council, and onward to press secretary for the Indiana Senate. Now working with the Marion County Election Board, Brent was a massive part of the management team that developed the Indy Votes Initiative, establishing 277 voting centers throughout Marion County, and he developed and implemented 200 um, and 77 of those voting sa early satellites, which ahead of the 2018 elections, added an additional 65,000 early voters. He shepherded the historic implementation of voting centers in Marion County as well, rather than having those specific polling locations. And this was the largest such program like this in all of the United States. Dr. Joseph Tucker Edmonds is a brilliant scholar and ed educator and trusted community leader who is gifted at discussing contemporary issues with a historical and contextual lens, especially the intersectionality of history and policy as his mentee Raven said right before we started. Dr. Tucker Edmonds is an associate professor of religious studies and Africana studies over at um, IUPUI and he is the Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Religion and American Culture. You can catch him in the classroom teaching religion and the politics of dissent in the African-American experience, comparative liberation theologies and comparative religions, or find him further pursuing interests in projects around these topics in African-American religions, religion and globalization, liberation theology, um, womenist theology, alternative Christianities, and new religious movements in the African diaspora. He has numerous authored and co-authored academic publications exploring the psychometric analysis of black men's experiences and cultural trauma, and has done deep dives into black identity and systemic disruption. He also serves as the president of the local Indianapolis uh, branch of the Association for the Study of A African American Life and History, and is a member of the editorial board of the Wabash Center's Journal on Teaching. And he leads a community engaged project that studies the impact of COVID-19 on black arts and cultural institutions in Indianapolis. Whew, quite the lineup of excellent with us this evening. I want to remind, I will remind you to toss your questions into the Q&A and any comments into the chat throughout the conversation. And so with all of that and with the one we're so glad to have our panelists with us tonight. I'm going to toss the conversation over to my colleague, Marianne Sheline, Director of External Engagement and Special Initiatives here at the Indiana Historical Society. Marianne. Hello, everyone. I'm going to give a, a somewhat brief intro to the topic, um, and then we'll get started with some questions and hopefully a really great discussion. So <clears throat> for the fourth conversation of Equal, a work in progress, we will talk about the complexities and realities of equality at the polls at a national and local level. In 1776, the founders of the United States declared that consent of the governed or people would be a key component of our country. The Indiana State Constitution of 1816 reads, all men are born equally free and independent and have certain natural, inherent, and unalienable rights. They and our national founders agreed that the power of our government should come from the will of the people and that the people would express their choices by voting in elections. While progress has been made, it is important to us to remember the context of these founding principles and decisions, particularly that in that moment, the founders believed that only certain people's wills were worthy to participate in voting. 
The framers of the Constitution decided to leave details of voting to the state, with, which led to many unfair voting practices. Only white men with property were regularly allowed to vote. President Andrew Jackson actually helped to advance voting rights for white men without property, and by 1860, most white men with or without property could vote. However, African Americans, women, Native Americans, non-English speakers, felons, and those under the age of 21 have had a longer battle to fight and in many cases are still fighting. The 1816 Indiana Constitution only allowed white male citizens over the age of 21 who had lived in Indiana for one year the right to vote. Following the Civil War and Reconstruction, the passing of the 14th and 15th Amendments federally guaranteed equal protection under the law and the promised right to vote to all men legally, but this was seldom true in actual practice. Indiana ratified the 19th Amendment in 1920, allowing women to vote. While Black women were active in the suffrage movement, they were typically excluded from organizations led by white women and were not usually able to vote, along with Black men, until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. While Native Americans were granted citizenship in 1924 with the Indian Citizenship Act, states continued to restrict their access to the ballot. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 is a landmark piece of le federal legislation that prohibits racial discrimination in voting, designed to enforce and secure the voting rights guaranteed by the 14th and 15th Amendments. While many more people have the right to vote as citizens, there are still ways in which some states' laws and circumstances actually discourage or prevent people from voting, so much so that Clinton issued, sorry, President Clinton issued the National Voter Registration Act of 1993 to further protect, maintain, to protect and maintain their voter registration. Historically, marginalized communities have had to overcome literacy tests, intimidation, and poll taxes to vote. Today, barriers include geographic isolation, non-traditional mailing addresses, lack of broadband internet, voter ID laws, limited transportation, fewer polling and registration sites, limited voting hours during a workday, and scarcity of other language assistance and the inability to register to vote on election day. Indiana has the earliest cutoff date of 29 days before the election allowed under federal law. Every election cycle, there are conversations about accessibility in voting and the regulations or state laws that make it harder for some citizens to cast their vote. Tonight, we'll talk about some of the context behind these issues and learn about how these state and local interpretations impact equality at the polls. Unfortunately, the journey is not over and the ideal of true equality and democracy must be constantly examined. All right, so let's start with kind of a, hopefully a more softball question. Could each of you share with us a moment that you first realized that you want to pursue a career in leadership and change making toward equality and what drives you to continue this work when you are discouraged? Am I going to pick somebody? <laughs> the ladies first. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead, Ruby. Oh, I was going to say, no, Brent, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I don't know if I have a, a spark or anything that kind of set me on a path, but I, um, I don't know, politics, I guess, part of my family's history, I guess. So like there was always a, a you know, a family push to kind of get involved and make change. Um, I worked a picket line when I was probably 10 years old. Um, so that was kind of maybe the first involvement uh, other than going to the polls with my dad. Um, and then you just kind of realize that nobody else is gonna make change. So you kind of have to jump in um, and try to, you know, forge a path that you wanna see. So that's kind of what got me started, but you know, it's, that's me, I guess. Yeah. I am very loud about my roots and where I come from, <laughs> but one of the things that I always like to tell people in honor of the those who came before me, uh, my grandmother had to leave her family home in the South in the middle of the night because the Ku Klux Klan burned down their home and their family land. Um, and so as a teenager, she and her siblings were split up because they had to be shipped in the middle of the night. Like she vividly told us this story about how she felt the rocks, the clay, the red clay beneath her feet because they didn't even have time to grab shoes, right? And so 
when you grow up with those stories, right, which so many of us in the African-American community have direct stories to the racial terror of the great migration, right? Some people say it's for, you know, economic development. It was a lot of it was racial terror. And so many of us have those stories. And when you grow up with those stories, that means you grow up with a sense of responsibility that this is where you come from. And if we're going to make the world better, it's not going to happen in one generation. It's not going to happen in two generations. It's not going to happen in three generations. It's going to happen over time. And so my my grandparents were activists, so much so that my mother, when she was 12, their home was firebombed. And exactly, right? And so when you have those generations of advocacy and activism, then it's it's a, similar to you, Brent, right? You are kind of indoctrinated to have this responsibility to to change the world and and leave it better than what it was given to you. And so that that was my spark, which I guess started when I was born, right? Because there was a legacy and responsibility that many of us are told we have in the marginalized communities because so much of our roots are rooted in, you know, that terror and that trauma. I love that, Raven, um, that you were that you were willing to share that with us. And, I, you know, Isabel Wilkerson talks about the Great Migration. She says it was about Black folks seeking political asylum in a country where they were that they were not seen as full citizens. Right. And so like, this was this Great Migration was not a migration of choice. This was not a migration of, of looking for just, a, you know, a, a more bountiful plot of land somewhere. But it was seeking political asylum. And when you talk about that vivid story of your of your grandma, mother and your ancestors, it, it reminds us of the, the work that folks did in order to find those places of asylum and to create out to create spaces of democracy when they got to these new places, right? And to to fight and to and to and to and to really to manage for other folks to be able to participate and to continue to do that work. I remember one of my earliest moments and that is as um uh probably eight or nine years old, my parents had a fundraiser for Kurt Schmoke, who would become the first Black mayor of Baltimore City, politically elected, you know, democratically elected Black mayor um, in the city of Baltimore. And I remember him being in my living room in Baltimore and thinking that, wow, the, the political process is not something that is out there or far off, but it's something that lives in the everyday practices of of our houses, of our families, of our churches. Um, and that galvanized me to, you know, I followed his career as, you know, like, a, you know, a nine, 10 year old. He spoke at my fifth grade graduation. I remember, you know, you know, after seeing him in my living room when I was eight and having, you know, having him show back up in my fifth grade graduation as the mayor of Baltimore was amazing. Um, and that reminded me of the, of the politics of, or the power of representation, um, and the promise of, you know, politics to transform and change not only individual people's lives, but structures and systems and institutions. Um, so that's how I got started. Mary, I, okay. I know, I'll get there. It's been a while since <laughs> I've been on a Zoom. <laughs> Thank you all very much for sharing that. Um, let's get into some meteor questions. Um, following the passing of the 15th Amendment, uh, which primarily affected African-American men, what was voting like for African-American men in the state? What were some of the success stories, challenges? Well, I mean, I, I'll jump right in. Um, just to kind of set some, you know, some historical context. I mean, we were talking about the passing of the 14th and 15th Amendments. For most people who are listening today, we know that that was, that was you know, federal law that then had to be applied on the ground. And as, as those are being passed across the country and happening here in the state of Indiana, we realized that there were really no to very little protections for Black male voters in the state of Indiana, right? There, 
were laws that had been in place that were removing um, new immigrants and migrants to the state of Indiana, moving them out, um, uh, you know, seizing land at that particular time, uh, taking away and and removing uh, ability to labor and partici to participate in the workforce if one chose to vote at that particular time. So really between the, the 14th and the 15th Amendment, and then I would say about 1885, which is like this, this 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 quintessential civil rights law in Indiana, which was really affording some of the 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 rights and the privileges associated with access to to restaurants and to other kinds of accommodations to Black and Native populations, that you really did not see Black folks actually uh, using or being able to employ the franchise up until about 1885. And even at the time that 1885 occurs, right, we have then a whole nother story of the emergence of white terror groups and other kinds of things that stood in the way of folks actually participating. Now I say all that, I'm gonna hand this over to Raven and Brent in a minute. I want to say that like, it was very difficult. It did not happen on mass. It was usually only very few people and they were protected by white elites or white institutions when they went to the poll. But that did not mean that there was not political organizing. If you look back at the historical record, there were the emergence of Black Republican groups in the in the 1860s, 1870s. There were emergence of Black Democratic groups that were at the later half of the, the 19th century. So these were folks that were organizing. They were thinking about how to access the polling booths. They were thinking about maybe putting folks up for candidates and for office. They, they were trying to work um, at sometimes with churches and other organizations to create spaces and polling options for Poor people. They were also working with Black women and white women to kind of try to see if they could secure the vote and if their securing of the vote would make it easier for Black men to vote, right? So there were successes in this moment. M many of them, however, were not actually getting to the vote and getting to the poll and actually voting, however. Yeah, I'm going to add on to that and say that here in Indiana, um, if you look at the history of the Indiana General Assembly, James Sidney Hinton, the first African-American to be elected to the Indiana General Assembly, was elected um, right before the turn of the century. However, with reconstruct post-reconstruction and the emergence of the modern Ku Klux, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan here in Indiana, we then saw a decline and an absence of African-Americans and people of color in the General Assembly. So I will also say that that is a success and an issue right because mm -hmm. they saw that what happens when individuals get access to the ballot then people who are reflective of the communities are then elected um, and that changed so one of my favorite things to do when I was when I was executive director of the Black Legislative Caucus and when we would have intern groups tour I would have them look at the pictures right see the all white male general assembly, see the very few African Americans, and then see all white again in like the, the mm -hmm. early 1900s. And, and so that is indicative of there were successes and then a plan was created to pivot. You, you get what I'm saying? It's going to make yeah. it makes sense because we see that today, right? We see what happens when individuals receive access to the ballot and we see how countermeasures go into effect and we see how that then begins to affect the community and it begins to affect the makeup of the servants or the, the public servants and then it, it puts us in a perpetual cycle of terror and trying to start again. So the successes were that we did get to see some elected, right? We got to see that representation. However, then countermeasures were placed into effect. And I'm going to say that much. And then I'm going to pass it to Brent. <laughs> uh, well, this is definitely not my area of expertise. Um, the historical part, I would just say um, there's probably... A lot of evidence that suggests that there's wasn't many uh, opportunities for folks to be protected at the polls, right here in Indiana or mm -hmm. elsewhere. So intimidation um, at the polls probably just scared, I would imagine, folks away to not even you know exercise their franchise to even like you know fight those hard fought battles uh, to to voice their opinion in their local democracy. And I, I don't you know I can't imagine what that would be like to be that afraid to come to the polls, uh, seeing what we have today, I guess. It's not perfect, but it's way better than I imagined uh, in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, yeah. 
So along with that and later on in our history, um, you know, I touched in the introduction of the topic that, you know, there were several Black women um, involved in the suffrage fight, uh, and especially here in Indiana, Madam C.J. Walker is held up as a, you know, very large example of, you know, a power player in that world. Um, so there are some additional women who were very influential in the state. Um, can we speak a little to their impact? And how was their story different from middle-class white women um, from Seneca Falls, like Susan B. Anthony? Um, what, what were some of the different trials they faced than uh, white suffragettes? Um, well, I'll lead with this. So I want to say shout out to the Ida's, shout out to the Julia, shout out to the, the Katie's, shout out to the women who helped pave the way for me to be able to walk in around in the state house, walk around the city county buildings, walk around the city and be resolute in, in my knowledge and in my fierceness and in my black womanhoodness, if that makes sense. So shout out to them. Um, I do want to say, first we have to acknowledge that one of the major key players of the, the suffragette movement said that I'd sooner cut off my right arm than for a Negro to have the vote, right? So let's, let's start with black women were used as tokens to further the agenda of the suffragette movement and unfortunately were told to sit down shut up and get in the back um and the reason that i lead with that is because i feel like we have to be transparent about what our history looks like or we'll keep falling into the pitfalls and so i'm really honest about that and and that's one thing that i want to talk about one of the things that people get caught up in is the term feminism. Um, but Patricia Hill Collins, Nikki Giovanni, Bell Hooks, they talk about womanism, right? Which is this different set of challenges that, that Black women have because not only do you enter the space as a woman, you enter the space as a woman of color, you enter the space as a Black woman. And so that means that the layers of complexity behind your oppression are different, right? And so when we talk about Black women in the voting movement, we talk about advocates who were irrefutably on the ground, who were the mothers of the church, right? Um, when I was an intern, we talked a lot about Bethel, AME, and the role of those Black women at the turn of the century who used this space that was a part of the Underground Railroad to continue to be a vessel of freedom in their engagement. We saw how they they really did send money to boycotts. They really did send money and resources um, to individuals and advocates who were in the fight and then were told, hey, as a woman, as a Black woman, just wait a second, right? They, they were told that, thank you for your brain power. Thank you for your, your diligence. However, sit down and be quiet. We'll get to you when we get to you. Um, unfortunately, that is indicative of that's that society, right? That's how we, we view these things. But when we talk about those Black women who helped pave the way to get individuals elected, right? They, they didn't just work on voting rights. They worked on campaigns, right? Um, I'm not going to start naming them because there are some who are unnamed and we don't want to, we, we don't want to do them this disservice, right? Because there are some who did just as much work, but their names are not in the history books because of the skin that they were born in. And so, um, we say that there, there were groups who certainly did the work, they did the strategy, they did the grassroots organizing before it was sexy, right? I always use the example of Ida B. Wells and the Chicago World's Fair, where they threw out pamphlets about um, lynching and the, the injustices that African Americans in this country face, and they did it on print, right? And then just threw the flyers off of buildings, right, JTE? They just threw out hundreds of thousands of flyers Right. But that is strategy, execution, grassroots execution at that with little tools, little tools. And, and that was led by black women. 
right, who talked about what it was like to be an African-American in this country, talked about the fact that we were excluded from the political process, right? That was in those pamphlets, right? How we offered so much labor and we received little in return. And so they were a part of that strategy. And then unfortunately they were told that, you know, you can't be in front. And so I say that to say one of my favorite quotes in the world is, I think it's Dr. Davis, um, I'm too, uh, too woman to be black, too black to be woman. And so that, that is something that those early women who did the work of the voting rights, um, era and of the civil rights era had to battle. I'm, I'm too woman to be black and too black to be woman. And that just talks about their exclusion in the process. Does that answer your exactly. question? Exactly. I mean, I, I love that. I mean, I, love, I mean, we can also talk about some of these, you know, you know, well-known, um, you know, historical figures like Sojourner Truth, you know, with the, the classic text, but she's responding back to these traditional white feminist fr suffragettes and saying, ain't I a woman, you know, ain't I, ain't I a woman too? Like, don't, don't I deserve the same kind of accommodations, but also the same kind of political interventions that you were suggesting should be afforded white women as it relates to the political and, uh, and social franchise, but also in terms of the well-keeping and the care of their bodies and their social and political lives, right? She was asking that question. You also have Folks like Anna Julia Cooper, you know, another one who is in the Midwest, who is saying when and wherever I enter as a black woman, the whole race enters with me. Right. So that when black women were doing the work to push for the suffrage, when they were. You cut off JTE. Yeah. You cut off. Your audio went out. Take your AirPods out. It's probably your AirPods. You hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> the second generation of women uh, of, of voters, they were actually saying, we're carrying this torch with us, right? Yeah. We're moving the, the, the project of Black male voting, of Black male suffrage, and we're taking it to the next, next level, right? That we're going to bring in everyone. We're going to deal with folks um, and issues around, you know, of child care. We're going to deal with these other issues that had not been addressed. We're going to provide safe harbor for folks who are moving during the earliest part of the 20th century. We're going to create social service issues agencies that actually help people get acclimated into these new cities, right? That some of these are things that Black male voters, when they did get the franchise, did not do, right? But as Black women were perfecting, right, you know, as Barack Obama said, perfecting democracy um, in this second generation, they began to really do this work and to really talk about the complexity of what it meant to be a part of this work. And so when we think about the earliest voters in Indiana, some of these earliest voters, um, when, um, the when the franchise was given to um, white women in Indiana were Black women, that they were at the front of the line. Even some of them were turned away, right? But they were at the front saying that we are going to vote, we are going to participate, right? Um, and actually push forward this long history of full franchise and equal rights and protection under the law. Yeah, and I think that, I think that the brilliance of the strategy is personified in individuals like Madam Walker, like right. the Ransom family, like the Flanagan. Right like the original Flanner House, like these institutions that in this community, because we came from a racialized terror, because we came from having to create our own ecosystems, like one of the most brilliant things I can also say that my grandmother did, who she didn't have more than an elementary education. When she came to Indiana, she still did community gardens, the land that she and my grandfather bought, they used the garage and turned it into an apartment for individuals who were coming from the South who needed transitional housing because so much of what Black women have been taught and how we have been raised, unfortunately, because of the institution of the country. Um, that means that when we carry community, we have to carry the entirety of it. So we have to think about food insecurity. We have to think about housing. We have to think about voting. We have to think about political processes. We have to think about all of that but it's personified in those earlier institutions that we see here in Indiana like that like I said like the Flanner House like the NAACP like West Side High School in Gary right let us not forget West Side High School in Gary is where they had the first national black political um, agenda convention right yeah. so 
the institutions were there and we can absolutely say that it was partially because of the strength, the strategy, the brilliance, and the execution of the, the Black women that were present. Right. I mean, Cheryl Townsend Joke says, if it wasn't for the women, right? That's, what, that's her quote. Like, if it wasn't for the women, and and it's, and it, and that and that's a kind of a holistic response. Sorry, Brent, I know you're about to, to jump in, but I was just going to say that it was these Black female teachers, right, who prepared folks for the literacy tests that that were still being deployed as 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 tools to prevent or suppress the vote who who helped them organize and save money so they could pay the poll tax right creating these first kind of mutual aid societies not only to bury people not only to send their kids to school but also to pay poll taxes and to participate and to own property so that they could be seen as full citizens and have access to the franchise this was the gift and the genius of many of these black women even when they still were not yet allowed to vote. The beginning. Yeah, all I want to say was uh, whatever the catalyst was, it's paying dividends because we would not have elections in at least Marion County without black women working the polls, bringing their families in to also staff the polls, uh, to work at our you know various sites for early voting. So after speaking with these folks, you, you realize very quickly that it's more than uh, just their civic duty. It, it's an inherent passion that they have to make sure that anyone who shows up to vote will get to vote. Um, and it, it, I imagine it's you know through their blood, through their heritage, that they've seen what happens when things don't um, play out the way that they should. And it's actually really remarkable. <laughs> so that's all I wanted to add. Yeah. Yeah, I will add that you know I've I've worked at polling locations basically almost every year of my adult life and I can only think of one time where I was not working alongside a black woman um they are ever present in our uh political system in Indiana I mean, um we've yeah. done a done a great job of being omnipresent from the beginning I like to remind people Coretta got the king got the king holiday Right, Come on that's now. not indicative of of what it is like. Coretta fought eighteen. What is it? Eighteen years to get the holiday right. that we know as Dr. King Day, and that is a personification, right, of what it's been like to carry community and carry that responsibility. Uh, and I mean, even here in this in the city of Indianapolis, and we're talking about the historical legacy of something like Crispus Attucks and the way in which they organized and brought together candidates and students and and black teachers. It was these black female teachers at Crispus Attucks that were doing this work, that were organizing, that were protecting these basketball players, that were bringing folks and creating the capacity, like you said, Bethel AME, Simpson Chapel, you know, the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA, you know, the the, the Walker Center. Like you just go down, you. Just just go down the street, right? These are these places where Black women were not only um, creating, but protecting and providing the kind of the real tool, the raw syllabus for folks to get out and then to participate in electoral politics and the larger social and political world. Yeah. Thank you all. So building on uh, the backbone of everybody's work and effort to go into uh, things like the 14th and 15th Amendments and the suffrage um, movement. What movement laws and policies actually enforced more equality at the polls? Because <laughs> we know some of the, the amendments and things like that did not do that in reality until much later. So let's talk a little bit more recent history of um, things that really did make change. Well, do we want to be honest? <laughs> of course. Um, I mean, they've all helped in their own ways, of course. But remember, we're still having issues today, right? Um, Bill Crawford brought a suit against um, Mary, Bill Crawford and the NAACP, if I'm not mistaken, brought a suit against Marion County um, last decade for potential voter suppression. Mm -hmm. Right. So we can sit here and be like, oh, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the National Voting Rights Act, they did so much. But we're still having these conversations. So clearly there are still failures. Um, and there and 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 as I said earlier, what we always have is 
people get quicker and smarter. So they say, okay, you figured out that loophole, you've made it impossible. Let's try another one. So we can say that they they did do a lot in their own ways, but there's so much more we have to do. And when I say they, I do, I refer to the 93 Act uh, or 94 Act. What, what year? I can't remember. 93. Uh, oh, yay. Look at that. <laughs> Um, 93 Act, uh, we can refer to the Voting Rights Acts because they, they did do something, right? I'm not going to sit here and say they did nothing. They moved the needle forward. But I am a bit more critical because I find when you say that they did everything, people sort of fall back and say there's nothing else to do. And then we lose the momentum that it takes for policy to be sustainable, does that make sense? So we're, we're, we're going to acknowledge that, you know, things like the literacy test and the poll taxes were supposed to be thrown out the water. I mean, you know, thrown out the way. But if you go and ask some people in Alabama, that was still happening in the 90s, right? In, in Mississippi, they were still having issues um, with real life poll taxes, with real life terror at the polls, like, they were still having issues. Just We saw what happened a few weeks ago with the Hines County um, in Mississippi having to be extended. We see what happens in Indiana. Remember, Marion County is a beautiful vote center. I'm so deeply proud of Brent and of Myla and of everything like LaDonna. I know the work that you all have done, um, but we still have eight hour times sometimes, right? And so we still have issues with people having access to getting to the poll in the middle of the day because of our strict times, right? We, we still do have some things that we have to take care of. So I do want to say, um, yes, there are some laws that have done fantastic. I'm going to let Brent talk more about that. But I also want us to be transparent and crystal cut clear in that means not as much as we would like it to mean these days, especially as we see um, post 2020 that black, brown, indigenous communities were the communities that helped lead the way in the election. And so that means that those communities, which Indiana is rich in indigenous, Latin and black are now gonna be more affected. Um, our General Assembly has um, no quarrels, unfortunately, coming every every election I mean every every session with laws that will shorten the time that you have access to the polls that will make it more difficult for you to get to the polls that will make it more difficult for you to cast your vote let's just be honest about that sorry for taking that but yeah no no I, I mean I, I think you're so right Ray. I mean I still think that like we can't you know, we can't undersell the like the Civil Rights Act of 1965, the Voting Rights Act, right? Like, these are important acts that like set into motion a particular set of practices that um, uh, allowed and enfranchised a large subset of the population that had been completely kind of disenfranchised, had completely been kind of wiped out of the democratic process, right? And so though they are not, though those laws are not perfect, Though they have not um, been perfectly kind of maintained over the last 50 or 60 years, right, we have in place a, a particular political infrastructure, right? I mean, I think that this is this idea, again, of if we go back to the language of our laws and we actually deploy them in a way that would allow for them to protect the interests of the most vulnerable, to protect the interest of those folks that had historically been marginalized and not allowed to go to the poll, we would have uh, an exciting and vibrant democracy. Unfortunately, and I think, Raven, you're exactly right, we don't have that because over and over again, we are constantly getting challenges and there are economic economic, political, and uh, social pressures to narrow those who have the right and the access to the vote. I remind people all the time that if you want to look at countries or uh, spaces where vo the voting and universal suffrage is something that's valued, these are often places where you have voting as a national holiday, where you have access to voting in a lot of new and unique and interesting ways, right? We have not decided to 
do that in this country, right? We have we have still continued to make voting and act a, a privilege that is afforded to those that have discretionary money, discretionary time, and the ability to overcome a particular set of logistical and technological you know, impediments. And those folks are the people that get to the poll. And we've got to continue to push, right? Because our voting, um, voting Rights Act and our Civil Rights Act have not really been updated to respond to the continued encroachment um, and the continued desire to limit the access and the franchise to certain groups of people. And so that's the problem. We are still working off of a law, even with its updates, that is, uh, you know, over too simple and not ready enough to actually protect the interest of every possible conceivable voter. Yeah, not only that, you know, the courts are chipping away at parts of the, you know, the Voting Rights Act, you know, those things that are kind of taking us backwards. Um, I, I guess the big example in my current line of work of uh, making it harder to vote is in 2020 during the global pandemic, when everyone was told to stay home, don't get around people, stay away. Uh, my office sent out, you know, 600,000 letters to people so they could apply to vote by mail. Um, and then now just this past legislative session, it's now illegal for a county election board to send out letters to encourage people to vote by mail. We can't preemptively send out applications because uh, when we did, we saw uh, the largest number of mail ballots we've ever seen. Obviously, some of that was, you know, offset the in-person voting uh, that we would normally see. But it was it was remarkable and stressful and overwhelming uh, to process all those mail ballots, but it was great to see people finding a new way to vote. Um, but again, like the legislature has kind of taken that ability away from us uh, and from the voters themselves who are now confused as to why they're no longer getting applications sent to them directly. Uh, so that's just one glaring example of, you know, a recent example in my line of work that's kind of pushed that away. Um, and then also, you know, when people go to the, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles to change their license and update the registration on the on the pad, they assume that that's automatic, but that is a different, you know, state agency and elections are run by county agencies. Those registrations don't come directly to the counties instantly. They go into what's called a hopper and then it has to be processed by the county voter registration office. And sometimes something is missed or the signature isn't like fully captured and it's rejected. So people think they're registered to vote and it's not until they're at the poll on election day or they're in person early voting that they realize their registration never updated from Morgan County to Marion County. So then they've essentially lost their ability to vote. Uh, they can vote provisionally, but county election boards aren't going to let somebody from a different county register and on that day and have their ballot counted. So there's all these little you know intricacies that the normal you know Joe Q public isn't going to be aware of until it hits them in the face, and then they they understand that there's these built-in walls or there's these things that they were not aware of that. Is it disenfranchisement? I don't know, but it's definitely aggravating and frustrating to the voter. And it's, you know, dilutes people's power at the polls that it's, you know, frustrating, obviously, because I hear about it and people are upset and they're angry that they don't get to cast their ballot. So those are just glaring examples um, from a week ago when we had a municipal election here in Marion County. <laughs> so. I mean, yeah. it's it's just so difficult because I mean, I think over and over again, as as we you know, we can we can zone in or zone out, but as we zone out and we think that you know, as you were reading, you know, these initial documents of the founding of our country and this goal to like in to universally um, franchise as many people as possible, like we see that these current laws, you know, and these current practices, um, and these you know, and some of these judges are actively engaged in voter suppression, and I think that we have to call it as such right because if we don't call it voter suppression then it is uh, is able to kind of operate outside of the kinds of discrete and specific constitutional violations that it is right and that we we can call it something else but it is not and so these folks we we should want everybody right why are we placing an impediment in the place of a 95 year old woman to be able to come and cast her ballot who's been doing it faithfully for the last 70 years because she has not updated this license or she has not been remind, remembered to turn in her ballot 29 days before. These are actions, though small, though seemingly insignificant, that actually change the outcomes of elections and actually change the real impact of everyone to participate in our democratically designed institutions.
Yes, and I know, Marianne, you have to get to the next question, but I also want to bring attention to, if you all notice, or you probably don't notice, around the country, what we've seen is that HBCUs are now being targeted specifically yes. for voter suppression. Like, we have some universities that have been split in half district-wise in the, the redrawing of the districts because of what we saw in previous elections. And so it is integral that, as I said, they saw that HBCU students were galvanized because our new vice president is an HBCU graduate. And so literally five HBCUs across the country have now been split district-wise. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, fam, you completely lost theirs. Mm. Right? So the, the section of Florida that FAMU is in, they no longer have a representative that is representative of them because they were drawn out, right? Mm. So we that's why it's important to call these things what they are and, and be intentional about calling it out and being firm in calling it out. Yeah. So, um, Brent, you touched a little bit about how in Indiana, you know, our election system is ran by the, you know, administered by the counties, individual counties. And Obviously, with your Indie Votes initiative and everything in Marion County, you know, much more diverse population than a lot of areas in the state and a lot more money. Um, so how does that uh, difference in socioeconomic factors and the population, both population density, population diversity, um, how does that impact the accessibility of voters in the most basic level, you know, at the local level? Sure. So um, I think that was a, a huge catalyst for trying to get the vote center program right when we when we sent, you know, when it was established in 2019. That was the first election. Um, we wanted to retain some of the, the sites that we've always had as vote centers uh, and those that we couldn't maintain. We wanted to find a place close uh, to that location, but on bus routes. Right. So like not, you know, Indianapolis has a huge transit uh corridors throughout uh, for buses that other cities and counties don't necessarily have. So that was a huge focus was if you lived close to a bus route, you could get to a voting site. Even if all else failed, you could get on a bus and get downtown to the city county building uh, right across the street from the main transit center uh, if you needed to get on a bus. Uh, and like I said, that's an issue that we deal with that not every other county has to deal with. We also have a lot more people, so we need a lot more poll workers, right? So trying to engage communities to get um, to the polls so that they can serve their community has been something very difficult for us to work on. Um, we always find people, but we would like to have twice as many for every single site, right? So trying to get that number of people, because you know you have to send bipartisan teams to uh, every location. So you're automatically starting with like um, two people and an inspector, and then as you build up each, you know, poll book, you need two people. So you're like the, the scale is much larger than you would see. So trying to like establish these sites, fund these sites, uh, staff these sites is something that you don't see in small counties. Even counties that have vote centers, they might have 16 in the entire county. We have 186 just last week. So we're dealing on a scale that isn't replicable in other counties. Um, I think we do a good job trying to spread them out, like I said, on uh, major corridors, bus lines, whatever we can do to make sure that people can get to a polling location. We advertise on the radio and newspapers on the internet to try to make sure people know where they can go, the hours they can go. And we now have early voting sites in every township, which is something new as of last year to make sure that no matter what township you live in, even Decatur Township that has a much smaller uh, population than anywhere else in the, in the county, they get a site so that people there can turn out to vote if they want to. Um, it's our least performing early voting site, but people who want to go there can, or if you jump off of an airplane and forgot to vote, you could head down to Decatur Township. So these are like instances that we as a county administrator try to make um, these things function. We try to make them um, accessible. Uh, it's not perfect, right? We're, we're trying to do what we can within our bounds, uh, but we have, I think, the most robust population-wise um, vote centers and access to the polls anywhere in the state. Uh, and that's something at least we're proud of um, as election administrators in the county. And like I said, we're we're not perfect, but we're trying to make sure people can show up and vote. And within that 12 hour window or 28 days before each election uh, at an early voting site. Yeah. And it's it's important to know 
that because of the way our society is set up, that means that the brilliance of our Marion County Election Board is also conflicting with some intentional structures that were meant to exclude entire communities. And unfortunately, you don't know the door is closed until you get up to the door. And so we we know that because of the socioeconomic um, status and because of the demographics of what this community once was, right, especially post UNIGOV, that means that there have been intentional doors being closed, if that makes sense. And so, because we know that although Marion County is unique, we know that our neighbors in Hamilton County don't have the same issues, right? Of course, they've got their own set of issues, but many of their doors are open, right? And they know which doors are closed and they're going to take care of it very swiftly. They're going to find the resources and the the um, support to do that. However, we're still going corridor to corridor and figuring out which doors are closed and how we can get them open and recognizing that a lot of them are closed because of the demographics of this community, um, despite, right? And remember in the 70s, 80s, 90s, think of all the work, the Bill Crawfords, the Julia Carsons, the the Joe Summers, the um, Duke Olivers, and, and all of the individuals who have been serving for decades. Think of all the work they've done. And then, then think about the fact that we still have so many doors closed. We still have so many barriers. Um, and so that should tell you how much work goes into making a structure equitable, um, specifically when it comes to civic engagement. Yeah, no, I love I love that. I mean, I always remind folks that, you know, and we can talk more about UNIGOV, and, 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 you know, if we want to, uh, you know, if someone has a question about that. But I just remind folks that all the work that those people that you did, and I'm so happy that Raven, you said their names and you're reminding folks of this long history of those folks, but that we still live in a state and a city that doesn't, that's only had white men as a, as mayor, as a governor, uh, as a leader of, of both houses or both parts, both chambers of the General Assembly. Like we, we live you know, this is a very narrow needle very, you know, that you have to like get through, you know, in order to participate. And those folks that have actually gotten in to that door have, have had faced such high hurdles in order to do that. And so um, I just want to remind folks that we still have a lot of work to do, right? You know, uh, in terms of providing real equity, right? Uh, for folks that have been historically and for the last 40, 50, 60, really 150, 50 years been strategically designed to remove them and to exclude them from the democratic process. Thank you all so much um, for talking about all of that because I mean it's it's a it's a huge factor in how we're voting today. Um, Raven, you had touched on, well, before I get to this question, I just want to remind everybody um, that there are guests. Um, please be thinking about um, any questions you have and go ahead and put those in the chat box um, so we can uh, hopefully hit on some of those. Um, but while I give you time to think, I will uh, ask another question. So Raven, you had spoken to essentially gerrymandering when you were talking about the HBCUs uh, districts being split and everything. And um, I think most of us know that Indiana is not new to the battle of gerrymandering. Can we talk a little bit about that in Indiana, how it happens, what it means, um, and if there are any immediate areas of concern that we should be aware of um, and trying to counteract right now? Yeah. Uh, well, Brent, you can start this one out. Oh, on gerrymandering? Okay. Um, so I, I did work 10 years uh, at the legislature for the Senate. And the caucus I was a part of, the Senate Democrats, we were gerrymandered down to 17 people, and then it went to 14. And then when I left, we had nine members. Um, and at that same time, we had a gubernatorial candidate who garnered 48% of the vote statewide. There was a statewide, um, at one point, uh, superintendent of public instruction that was a member of the, the Democratic Party. So you see how gerrymandering splits the vote into these, you know, various wedges and weird shaped um you know districts all over the all over the state uh but when in reality at the time there was you know 50 
just under 50% of the entire population were voting for members of the Democratic Party, uh, but it's not represented in the, the House of uh, Representatives nor in the uh, in the Senate. So that is frustrating. People obviously didn't have their uh, representation that they that they were you know that they deserved. Um, and so obviously people were diluted, although packed into districts, their voice was diluted statewide and the public policy, I think, suffered from that uh, for years and years and years. Um, and, you know, it's a disservice, obviously, to the people of the state. I, I want to just jump in and just because ask Raven for y'all to talk about because I know y'all know these statistics better. So I'm just going to throw I want to because I, I wanted to make sure I understood Brent correctly. Like, I think that isn't it like almost like close to 70 percent of the House seats are Republican and almost 80 percent of the Senate seats are, you know, in a state that doesn't that I just make sure that everybody in the audience heard that say it so they can hear it in the back of the room. Right. In a state that is not divided to that degree between Democrats and Republicans, the representational politics show a much different um, uh, divide, right? And so we have to then be concerned about the laws, the practices, all of the the legislation, the the the, the distribution of funds, how that is then shaped by a gerrymandering policy that then leads us to a place where Republicans are overrepresented, right, in the work and um, the policy making of our state. You know, and 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 the goal of gerrymandering is, is to make it them overrepresented in throughout the country. But I mean, or particular groups be overrepresented throughout the country. Because I'm not suggesting this is only something that Republicans do. I think, you know, party, the two party system has used and deployed gerrymandering but in a number of different ways. But go ahead, Raven, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back to y'all experts. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's important to say that gerrymandering, uh, I saw that Lauren put the definition up there, but to uh, summarize it, it is the process of redrawing the lines and redrawing the maps in a state or in a county or in a district um, to align and to create a more partisan election result, right? So it can be done on either side. Um, that's really important to know. It's really important you know, to keep in mind. Um, and Indiana has one of the most gerrymandered maps in the history of the United States right now. Uh, <laughs> and to go further into that, um, to what uh, Dr. JT, Dr. Joseph Tucker Emerson was saying, um, which are that out of 150 legislators, you're looking at roughly 30 something um, Democrats, uh, 10 on the Senate side, um, 20 something, if I'm not mistaken, on the Democrat side. That that number is probably a little higher now because I worked for the legislature before the last election. Um, but you're looking at roughly 30 to, to 40, maybe we'll say 45 on a good day of Democrats in 150 member leg legislature. Um, and what that means is we're seeing um, the majority of the state is not represented in in the vote, right? We know that that is in the 70s or 80s of individuals who the, the legislature is not reflective of that um, pattern, unfortunately. Um, and so what that means, to get back to what Marianne was saying, is that encourages voter apathy, disenfranchisement, um, and people leaving, right? That's what we're seeing, something fierce in Indiana. Um, if we talk in the, the wake of some of the most recent Indiana um, bans, we saw people rescinding applications to the universities here. Like, they were like, you know what? Or I won't go to college there. Um, or I won't raise my family there. Or I won't do X, Y, and Z because when you have a gerrymandered map and you have overrepresentation, that means that things are failing, things are slipping through the cracks, and it just so happens that you pair that with a lack of healthcare, food insecurity, because our gerrymandered maps and our redlining maps and our food insecurity, health disparities maps, they all align, right? They all overlap when it comes to issues of gerrymandering is on purpose, right? It's to disenfranchise, it's to exclude. Um, and so we have that happening here in the state of Indiana. We're known for it. The process is supposed to be third party, but let's be clear. The way the rules are set up to do 
the process of redrawing the maps post the census and, and you're wondering how do they even get to gerrymandering well they take the data from the census and they say well because of this area is reflective of x y and z we're going to draw it to do x y and z right and so unfortunately that contributes to a host of issues that we don't have time for because i, I know that miss joanne joanne had their hand raised <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Joanne, if you could go ahead and uh, type your question into the chat um, in the Q &A. or the Q or the Q&A section um, and we can work on that. Um, I will um, start with another question I received. Um, so, you know, speaking about a two party system, which, you know, the U.S. It mostly is, we, ha we have some third parties, um, but none have uh, become um, strong enough to be on uh, the same level as the Republican and Democrat parties um, in current history. Um, so this person's asking, is there anything that can be done about a city that places its vote centers in Republican areas and has very few vote centers in a Democratic area? And that's basically, I mean, that's kind of gerrymandering the, <laughs> the voting centers, but basically disenfranchising one party. Um, from voting. Is there anything that can be done on that? I guess I'm not aware of anything. Um, and you know, one of these weird parts of Indiana election law is every county has a three person board essentially that's, yeah. uh, that is the election board, right? So it's, it varies from county to county, but essentially it's uh, a member of the Democratic Party, a member of the Republican Party, and then the clerk uh, is the secretary, uh, and they obviously belong to the Democratic or Republican Party in this in this state. They basically establish where each vote site will be, each polling location, each vote center. Um, so outside of that, I, I don't know what else would be done um, in placing these at various parts of the county, right? So I guess go to board meetings, voice your concern, you know, be kind of like somebody who can uh, ask the, the questions of the board as to why they're placing these vote centers or polling locations where they are and um, come ready to staff them, right? Like find folks that you want to help staff and get people to the polls. Um, that seems a little like, I don't know, childish, I guess, but you want to make sure that if you're going to um, show up, you're going to want to have a, a, an answer and a plan for folks who are going to ask questions of you. Yeah, and I will say, because I'm going to also answer a part of, 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 of Richard's second question before we get to the the first question. I mean, said, they said that gerrymandering is a problem. What are the solutions? Okay, so when we talk about this, what Brenton just said, which is go, don't be afraid to go and have those conversations with the election board. I'm also going to say, don't be afraid to have those conversations with like the ACLU and Black Voters Matter and these national organizations who might have more resources sources to maybe engage in some litigation or at least call the the issue into question right because a lot of people rely on us being an isolated or or landlocked space that people really aren't going to pay attention to or no one's going to really hold individuals accountable outside of our state um and so don't be afraid to do that also, don't be afraid to go out there and engage um, with individuals who have been serving either elected or non-elected and do some grassroots organizing to call it into question. Start having those conversations with your elected officials, both locally um, at the, and, and at the state house. Also, don't be afraid. I know this might not be nicest, but don't be afraid to start recruiting to build a bench to start having people maybe run against some of these individuals. Um, <laughs> I know you're probably like, what? No. But if you want to get somebody out, sometimes you'd be surprised how many people also feel what you feel, but these people keep running unopposed because everyone is tired or people don't have the resources or people don't have the support to get up and get them up out of there. And so we also want to call that into question, right? Don't be afraid to build the bench. Don't be afraid to do that grassroots community organizing where you go, you talk with your neighbors, you build your coalitions, you have town halls. Don't be afraid to hold these individuals accountable by calling them, texting them, emailing them. And then also know that you have a right to to chat with like the ACOUs, with the NAACPs, with the, the voter organizations, with the vote for four vote for one one because people know these things are happening but when we talk about things like litigation and when we talk about actual accountability measures 
they also need people from the state, from inside of the districts that are affected to go and say, hey, I see you, stop, right? Um, however, unfortunately, because people are exhausted, because this is a battle that takes time, money, resources, people fall off or um, people don't have the strength or the resources to carry it on. Does, does that help answer your question, Richard? And, and, I, and I also say, I mean, I'm reminded of the ways in which you, when we when we harness our collective power, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning bringing together organizations that don't seem to maybe have the same, you know, exact interest or outcome, but that there are some overlap, overlapping or converging interests and oftentimes around issues like gerrymandering or some of these kind of political processes, we can find some groups that we may not think of, oh, there are, those are our people, you know, mm -hmm. all the way from A to Z, but there are enough of our people from A to E that we can kind of work with them and organize and raise the kind of money. I mean, I think that Stacey Abrams in Atlanta and in Georgia was an example of bringing together a kind of a, you know, obviously highlighting the problem, right? Like talking very explicitly as a part of a general election campaign, the gerrymandering, voter suppression, you know, nullification of certain rights was a, was a key part of the electoral and democratic process, just making that a platform wherever you go. But secondly, by aligning and bringing to He froze. Um, he's talking about by aligning and bringing together the coalitions. I know what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 sorry. <laughs> but bringing, bringing together a motley crew of people to bring together and deploy some of these practices around the country, right? That you know that you can now align with some of these folks, the you know, traditional white women feminists, right? That, you know, from 100 years ago, right? We're now bringing them back into the fold and saying, we've got to fight for this, right? The, you know, some of the, the, the union and labor organizers that may not look like all of Stacey A. Abrams kind of core voters, bringing them in because they have a vested in, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, there are these ways in which we can respond to gerrymandering in, a, in some different ways and some different kinds of organizing as well. Yeah, Richard and to the crew, I like to use the three E's, education, engagement, empowerment. We have to educate people about the issue. We have to educate ourselves about possible solutions, um, engage, which means we have to get up and we have to try to do it ourselves. And then empowerment is that we empower others to do the same, to follow the process. Um, and so that is one of the ways that we tackle things like gerrymander. We get we educate people on the issue, what options we have, what we can do. We engage, i.e. we go out there and we challenge the system. And then we empower others to do it as well so that it is strong, coalition-based, and that mm -hmm. it's sustainable. Because I don't know about you, but my favorite line is, retire me, please. <laughs> I don't want to do this forever. <laughs> All right. So another question we had um, in the chat uh, regarding the 2013 Shelby County versus Holder decision by the U.S. Mm -hmm. Supreme Court. Um, and did that have any impact of voting suppression in Indiana? And does that decision matter to Hoosiers? So for a quick refresher for folks who are not aware, um, this decision by the Supreme Court um, basically ruled um, one section of the well, not even a whole section, a, a sub B section <laughs> of uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, they ruled it unconstitutional in 2013. And this was about um, states and jurisdictions getting pre-clearance from Congress um, before they could um, enact uh, changes in voter rolls, you know, basically any elections. Um, and the Supreme Court's decision was based on that the formula that was used for preclearance was um, outdated. It was over 40 years old and it made it no longer responsive to current needs and therefore um, a bigger burden on constitutional principles. So can anybody speak to the impact that had on Indiana or still has? Brent, you want to go first? I'm going to let Brent go first on this one. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, my gosh. Um, well, I, I'm not an attorney, I guess. So I guess if um, if a cynical person were to think about it, I, I think you could say 
the impact it may have had on Indiana because we weren't a Southern state. We weren't one of these states that had a history of, you know, needing preclearance or needing, you know, the, the, uh, this act. I think a cynical person could say that it it gave a little clearance to folks who may want to test further this law, right? The civil rights law and say, if this is unconstitutional, what else can be poked and prodded? And there's like this whole industry, I think you could say in constitutional law that says, if you poke and prod and you get a new justice on the court, that determines what can change. And, I, and maybe that's what's had a bigger impact uh, in Indiana and some of these other states that weren't part of the traditional South, um, more than just a direct impact from you know this provision being overturned. Um, like I said, I'm not an attorney, but that's, I think a cynical person could think that. I mean, I, I'm gonna go along with you, Brent. I think that this like opens up the floodgates, like this, this, this removal of the preclearance, um, you know, especially for certain jurisdictions that had a historic or a legacy of denying and including the vote. If we're saying that they don't even have to be under um, oversight or direct constraints, then we're opening up the gates for that everyone else is saying they're not going to come for us. So we're going to try new things in order to continue to disenfranchise, in order to, 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 to kick people off the voting rolls, in order to take back or to tamp down on new initiatives or practices that were actually franch enfranchising folks. I wanted to drop into the chat, you know, a couple of groups like um, Stacey Abrams group called, I think it's called Fair Fight is her organization that folks can look at. I mean, they talk Talk about this kind of history and the work that they've done. Um, and Eric Holder's group, I think, is called like in Democratic Redistricting or something like that. Or in, you know, but they're both of these groups are groups that are really paying attention to gerrymandering um, and the slow erosion of these kinds of things. And I think that's exactly what you're pointing to, Brent. That like this this is not a direct threat, but it's always a direct threat if there is not an explicit correction, right? And I think that that's the problem, right? Without an explicit correction, without an explicit naming of a value, then um, you know, folks are going to chip and prod and and eventually remove those kinds of protections, especially for people who they do not care about. Yeah, Indiana likes to purge people from the voter rolls. Hmm. Um, they have a, see, this is, this is me. I know y'all are like, she's sharp with it tonight. Listen, let's be clear. Indiana likes to purge people. And that is because they go unchecked because they, the, the list of, and Brent, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the list of uh, examples and reasons be why they can continue to purge people continue to get longer. It, it it continues to get longer, right? One day it's well if you if you didn't fill out the 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 index card, another it can be well you have the same name as your deceased uh parent. Well, another can be you had a recent name checked. It like the list gets longer of how they can do it, um, and I think it's directly rooted to related to going unchecked, right? You know how Brent and um, Dr. Joseph Tucker Evans said, hey, like, it's like a slow chip. Let's also call it into how the last redistricting slash gerrymandering process went, right? There were tours in a COVID society that were, that happened in the middle of the workday in isolated communities where people didn't have access. Like, that's a product of this decision, right, of how they're able to navigate the legislation that is proposed every session. I'm like, is anybody going to say that this is unconstitutional? Um, and if it makes it past signy die, then we are going to court again. Um, <laughs> but I think that that continues to happen because it is a, it's chipping away and it's seeing how far we can go. Let's be clear. Votes are one person. So you can win or you can lose by one person. And I'm going to be transparent. The way things are looking, that crew is one person away from really hitting voter rights in Indiana. Um, because each year, that legislation as it evolves and and they tweak and see what they can get through, they get more votes and they get more support. And so I think it's indicative of what we saw happen in 2013. And I also think it shows that there is a commitment 
to voter suppression that we just can't get over as a state or as a nation, as a world, right? But but mainly as a as a state and as a country. Like there is an internal commitment, a diligence, a persistence like a gnat at a barbecue to chip away at voter rights and democracy and it, until we start addressing that it's going to continue to chip away exactly and, and, and at the highest levels of government right uh, that, that like I, as the supreme court is voting for this and saying that those protections i mean they're saying that those protections are unconstitutional but they're not providing a corrective to say how do we protect the constitutional right to the franchise right so they're saying that the protections or the corrections are unconstitutional but they have not or we have not as a country had the collective political and social will to then introduce something else that would then protect the, that franchise that was trying to be protected by these other rules and other laws oh so this sounds discouraging no don't don't be discouraged <laughs> <laughs> don't don't be discouraged um I hold up because I want to make sure I see this question because I'm going to tackle it. Um, what encourages us? Okay, so I can say I am honored to be a brown girl that inspires other brown girls. I have taken my part and my role in this lineage of freedom fighters. And because they survived, I know I can. There is hope in this world. There is beauty in this world. There is joy in this world. And my nieces, my nephews, my family, my friends, my community are worth me fighting. And that is what encourages me. That is what gives me hope. I'm a firm believer that if my ancestors can burn down Naiti and challenge the French, then I can get up here and say that the IGA has some issues with voter suppression. And I'm going to be just fine. Because you ain't got no heaven or hell to put me in. You could try. But I ain't worried about it. And so that, that, that is what encourages me. That is what pushes me, the beauty and the joy of what I know this world and what I know my community can look like. I know that there are resources. I know that there is wealth. I know that there is opportunity. We just got to get to it. And exactly. we got to open those doors. I mean, and we're seeing voter energizing. We're seeing voter activation. We're seeing community work all over the place. I get energized when I look at the, you know, I talk about my first moment in Baltimore when I was eight years old was Kirk Schmo coming to my house and, and winning the mayor election. I now see that we have a, a young black mayor of Baltimore who is a single black man who's running and doing his thing and and trying, you know, and so like, you know, I, I, that, that gives me hope. I get hope when we look at local school board elections and that you see people running and getting involved for the first time in the democratic process, running as candidates that haven't had a whole lot of experience in history, building coalitions, you know, creating new kind of partnerships and thinking about new ideas. That gets me excited. Even when I see someone like, you know, um, Robin Shackelford run for mayor of, of, of Indianapolis, that, that gets me excited because even though we don't have a history of a Black woman or even a woman being the mayor of Indianapolis yet, we have that possibility out there. People are going to keep pushing. Our My daughter, and other people are going to see those images and they're going to believe that that's possible. And that encourages me that we are teaching, that we are encouraging and, Ra and Raven, we're empowering folks through conversations like this tonight, that people are getting information, that they're learning about their history and that they're figuring out ways, small and big, that they can change the process and the places in which they live. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry, Brent, but I, I want to add, I think it's also important to know that this is what keeps me warm at night. When you enter into a space like this, you have to have passion, compassion, and persistence because we recognize the responsibility we have in this here space. And so that also is real, right? And so it's, it's not as easy to get discouraged because I knew what I was signing up for, but that didn't mean that I wasn't going to try to kick the doors down. Yeah, I, I have nothing else to add other than like, you know, just seeing people show up at the polls, people, you know, it's very rare, but we do get compliments for the actions we take on election day. And it's those things that just like knowing that there's 
100,000 people or 200,000 people that show up, they cast their ballot, they speak their voice. Um, as hard as the work is, it's always great to like see that happen and know that you've been a part of making sure people live in a thriving democracy, if, if we can say that, and like be a part of something in their neighborhood and just, you know, choose their own destiny, however that goes. And that, that, that kind of keeps me going. Thank you, Rick, for that great question uh, to lead us into our final question of this evening. Um, so for each of you, I'd like you to please give your top call to action for all of us to be able to confirm voter rights and equality moving forward. I guess uh, for me it, in, in my field, it's, it's show up, right? Like if you want to be an active participant in your democracy, you have to be educated, you have to know where to go and you have to participate. So not only is it is it voting and making sure that your voice is heard, but show up and be a poll worker, find out what it takes to like encourage folks to be out there, to be a, you know part of an efficient program to make sure people can vote. Even if it's just that one day, or if you wanna volunteer and helps initial ballots for the mail board, or if there's things that you think you can do to just make sure people in your community can vote and have a say, um, you don't really get to complain if you don't be an active participant. And that's to be a voter, to be a worker, all of those things. So that, that's kind of my call to action. It's, it's selfish. If you live in Marion County, it's very selfish of me, but it's, it's something that needs to happen throughout the entire state. So folks understand how this process works. Um, it's not a spectator sport. It, it takes active participants. And I'll, I'll go along with that because I want, you know, Raven to close us down. But I'm going to say name and resist like wrongdoing whenever you see it within this. Like, you know, like we have to be, you know, you know, prophetic voices in the wilderness. Right. You know, we've got to like if we see something that's not right, when we if we see someone being disenfranchised, if we see someone being suppressed or marginalized, it, especially in this voting and democratic participation uh, we've got to name it. We've got to resist it. We got to put our money where our mouth is. We've got to ante up and really suggest that whether or not it is individually affecting me, if it is affecting the larger democratic process, it is changing and shaping the world that we hope for our children and grandchildren to live in. And that means you got to name it, you got to resist it, and you got to do something about it. And I, so, so yes, participate. Yes, show up. But I want you to name and resist wrongdoing. We got to call people out, get them them off the ballot, make sure they don't get reelected, make sure that we line up and change the policies. Those are the things that we've got to do every day. It is hard. It is difficult. It is time consuming, but it's necessary. Yeah. So since we started with Sojourner, I'm going to um, start my um, closing with the end of Sojourner's speech, which is, if the first woman God made was strong enough to turn this world upside down, then everybody here should be able to flip it right side up, right? And so I want us to remember that. I want us to remember the three E's to educate, engage, and empower. So that means bring your knowledge, share your knowledge, and ensure that others are able to do the same. And I need us to know that this is a contact sport, right? As, as Brent said, this is, this is not a spectator. This is contact, which means you're going to get bumped. You're going to get shifted. You're going to need to think quick on your feet. You just have to be clear about that because whether they know it or not, the founding fathers gave us a reason to flip this place upside down. They said, if this country, if this democracy is not working for you, don't go do some of the other stuff that people have done, but that you have an obligation as a citizen to call it out and to hold individuals accountable. So remember that when you are feeling nervous or when you're feeling quiet or when you're feeling internal and you don't want to make that external, right? Um, and also know that when I tell people like, hey, this is the presidential Barbie reporting for duty, always here to charm, disarm and sound the alarm. I need you to listen to black women the first time, go out there, change the world and be impactful. There is a reason that those words are in my tagline whenever I'm conversing with communities, because when I say that we're here to charm, disarm and sound the alarm, that acknowledges that we are here to shake it up. 
and then to challenge you to go out there and change the world because it could be you reading a book today. It could be you reading an article. It could be you challenging misinformation. It could be you going to the polls. It could be you driving people to the polls. It could be you helping to educate someone regarding what and who is on the ballot. It could be you going to a long-term care facility and helping someone who needs access fill out an absentee ballot because organizations do that because everybody doesn't have access. It could be you calling your family, your friend, your cousin, your best friend saying, hey, you know that there's a race coming up. You know, there, there's an election coming up. I need you to know about it. Or, hey, there's a bill that's happening down at City Hall or there's a bill that's happening down at the state legislature. And I want to go down there and testify. I want to write an email. I want to do all of that. Changing the world starts with you. Being impactful starts with you, and I need you to remember that. So again, you've heard brilliant activists, brilliant advocates to give you the keys to the kingdom. This is Raven, the presidential Barbie, here to charm, disarm, and sound the alarm, reminding you to listen to Black women the first time, go out there, change the world, and be impactful. I'm right there next to you. I know you can do it. I know we can do it. Okay. Raven for president. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so, so much. That was a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Um, you guys were fantastic about adding context, uh, historical context, and also current day steps um, and thoughts to, for all of us to keep in mind as we move forward with future elections and voting rights. Um, I think we are good for this evening. So I'm gonna pass it back to Lauren tonight to wrap up the program. Yes, um, so to reiterate what Marianne said, um, thank you so, so much uh, to Raven, Brent and uh, Dr. Tucker Edmonds. This was, and of course my coworker Marianne, this was an amazing conversation um, and call to action for all of us, no matter what our political standing is, what our beliefs are to at least know where we need to get our information and know that we have work to do for equality at the polls, know we have work to do for um, paying attention and um, calling out, making sure that our neighbors all have the same rights. Um, we so appreciate the time and energy that uh, each of our panelists gave for tonight's incredibly important conversation. And thank you as well to all of you participants who joined us tonight and to all of the future viewers for once this gets on our website. Um, for engaging in this important topic and for everyone who contributed tonight's conversation. Thank you also to the Charlita and Robin Winston Family Fund for African American History for sponsoring tonight's program. If you enjoyed this program, we hope you'll consider joining us for other great events, um, which you can find on our events calendar, calendar on the website. And if you're nearby, we hope you'll also come and visit us during our annual Festival of Trees come see the many trees sponsored by many wonderful organizations around the state um, and hang out with us and have a wonderful festive time. We will post this conversation to the IHS YouTube channel on our website in the upcoming weeks. And so in the meantime, you can explore our previous virtual programs while you wait for that to drop and hear this conversation again um, and check out those other conversations on our YouTube channel. And that is on our website. Um, and Bethany will be dropping that link too. If you missed your chance to donate or would like to make a further gift to support the Indiana Historical Society, please visit our website on the link in the chat. And your support allows us to continue to share Hoosier stories and continue to have conversations like the one we just had. Finally, you'll get an email from us um, tomorrow morning with all these links and a survey included, and it will take about two minutes. So we'd love to know what you thought and how we can make programs and conversations like this even better. So with that, thank you all for joining us tonight. Th thanks again to Raven and Dr. Tucker Edmonds and Brent and Marianne and the Charlotte and Winston Family Fund for African American History. Um, stay safe and healthy, and we can't wait to see you virtually or in person sometime soon and at the polls. Good night. <laughs>